Thank you for the introduction. Um, before I start speaking more, well, before I start to divulge more into the arms trade, I think, first of all, it's really important to highlight that today actually marks the 18 year anniversary of the US and UK occupation of Iraq, right? A war that saw over a million civilians dead, many more refugees created, and a political vacuum that led to the existence of ISIS and all the irreparable violence that they inflicted on the Iraqi people. And almost everyone on every side had lost from the war, right? But there's only one side that had won, and that's the neoliberals and the arms dealers. The arms trade packages itself as something that is supposed to bring safety and security, when in all actuality, it's probably the most dangerous and illeg illegitimate trade to ever exist. And Andrew Feinstein says it best, right? The author of Shadow World. He says from all our technological advances, the rise of terrorism and global crime and seeing state-sponsored violence and socioeconomic inequality continuing to rise, instability, um, to the most alarming levels, right? We are somehow not any safer, and this is by no surprise. The arms trade is an institution which is not regulated. It is not legitimately financed. It's never been policed. It's never been transparent in its dealings. And of course, it's never been, been brought to accountability for all its crimes that it has committed, right? And yet somehow we're supposed to believe that or be fooled that this is for our safety. It's the same old tired neoliberal story, right? Misery and death for millions and profit and welfare for the few. And what's the result of this? What is the result of, I suppose, decades of these illicit gray area dealings? And first and foremost, it corrupts our democracies. It weakens already fragile states. It undermines the national security it claims to protect. And it literally ignores better economic alternatives. So whilst I was doing the research for this panel, I saw that the newest data from the UK defense and security exports showed that whilst the US dominates the global market for defense exports and the arms trade, um, with an estimated 47% of the market share last year, the UK came in second um, with a 16% share. And I suppose what's interesting is that the UK likes to pretend that their customers are benevolent or noble, or they're really unaware of the crimes that they may commit, etc. But when we really look at who the UK sells its arms to, we can see that they do it to some of the most deadly, deadliest occupiers in the world. The UK is one of the, and um, the US is one of the UK's customers. And how does the US use the arms that the UK sells? for its racist policing and to lock up undocumented migrants through its ICE task force for severe human rights abuses, right? Last year in June, we saw the astonishing Black Lives Matter protests, protests that took place all over the world. We saw everyone join together and stand against police brutality, demanding either a complete abolition or the defunding of the police and just for it to stop, right? And how did the US respond to this? How did the government respond? by shooting the same rubber bullets and throwing the same CS gas that the UK has provided and sold. And that, that doesn't even really go into detail of the weapons that the UK provides the US that the US then uses internationally as it attacks them, right? Alongside with the US, the UK also sells arms to Brazil. And it's no secret that President Bolsonaro is a horrendous, horrendous homophobe, a horrendous sexist, is a downright a fascist, and uses these arms to repress and quell indigenous protests, right? As he tears down more indigenous homeland in Brazil. The UK also sells its arms to Israel. And in spite of the fact that we know, and the world and the international courts know, it legally occupies Palestinian lands and it treats them as second class, if we can call it that even, citizens. Um, and the UK continues to provide these weapons, right? And of course, most um, recently we see the UK continuing to defend its sale of arms to Saudi Arabia. And we've seen how Saudi Arabia uses these arms for its repression in its own country, for its repression in uh, on the citizens of Bahrain, and of course, Yemen. 
So right now in Yemen, right now, there is a staggering 20 million people facing famine. Horrific breakouts of cholera, typhoid, and of course, coronavirus is even coming into play. And despite what should really cause an international outcry to help the people of Yemen, Saudi Arabia has responded with airstrikes that has purposely targeted Yemen's agricultural sector, its sewage system, its civilian boats, and its medical facilities, despite the fact that Saudi Arabia knows and is aware of the coordinates for these medical facilities. So any chance that a developing nation has had to tackle um, coronavirus, and we've seen countries all over the world struggle, right? Yemen is already at a disadvantage because how can it fight coronavirus as it's being um, bombed to the ground by Saudi Arabia? So make no mistake that the UK plays an implicit, direct and umbilical part to what the Saudi Arabia does to Yemen. So any crime that Saudi Arabia commits then so does the UK. We have BAE systems manufacturing typhoon fighter jets for Saudi Arabia here in Wharton. We have MBDA manufacturing tank missiles for Saudi Arabia in Hertfordshire. We have Raytheon manufacturing guided bombs that Amnesty International has proven was used in an attack to, in a ceramics factory. And in spite of that, in spite of the proof that we have seen, the UK government um, has not only tried to stop selling arms, but instead has fought to campaign against arms trade and the judicial system to in fact sell more and accelerate the sale of more arms. And it's as if there's this sense of urgency yeah. to make more profits more quicker. And of course, at the expense of the deaths of more Yemenis, I previously mentioned in one of my previous talks with Kat that the Human Rights Watch had a document reported in um, and written in 2016. And it details um, previously documented airstrikes on civilian economic structures. So there was clear evidence that these weapons are killing innocent civilians that have been manufactured here. The report discussed how these airstrikes used um, were against factories, warehouses, two power stations, a farm. It killed 130 civilians, injured 170 more. The facilities hit by the airstrikes um, really importantly produced, stored, and distributed the goods for the civilian population, including food and medicine. And now we're here at an impasse and we're seeing so many people face famine as a result of it. And these attacks were targeting um, sectors of the nation that was quintessential for its survival. And that Raytheon paveway guide, the bombs, as I mentioned earlier, is built and manufactured here in Harlow. And not only that, but there's further admissions of guilt um, written in government documents, um, written evidence by the Foreign and Commonwealth Sec um, Office about the shadow missiles used in Yemen, etc. The list goes on, right? Um, the same document also goes on to speak about how the UK and the um, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia enjoys a deep and long-standing history of friendship and cooperation. And we know what the friendship and cooperation looks like. It looks like repression. It looks like death. It looks like um, targeted attacks for the many. So one of the ways Britain has formally tried to sanitize its role in Yemen, like, oh, but look, we're also the good guys, is by, I guess, claiming that they have committed aid to giving aid to Yemen. And I've previously talked and um, spoken about how this is a complete farce, right? But now on top of the weapons that they sell to Saudi Arabia, they've also decided to cut the same aid to Yemen. So on top of the violence that they inflict, they're not even trying to do anything or try to pretend that they're trying to alleviate any, any of it. Um, and to take a quick side note, what makes it all the more sinister, I suppose, is that the UK government fails to address the ways in which the arms trade has undermined economic or de developmental progress um, is because these nations are aware of the deadly impact that neoliberalism has had in Yemen for the past two decades. Um, and I'm sure everyone understands what neoliberalism is, but for those who don't, it's just the idea that governments should be as small as possible and businesses should be big as possible. So we've seen the effect of, effects of austerity in the UK because of neoliberalism. We've seen how deadly of an impact it's had in Iraq. We've seen what it did to the people of Chile um, and Salvador Allende. You know, the, it's, it's the deadly effects of uber capitalism, which is what neoliberalism is. And it's happening in Yemen. 
We've seen the policies that the IMF has combined with the former regime's um, complacency in its government that has caused 70% um, youth unemployment, 17% of people in Yemen are illiterate, only 8% of its labor force right now has any kind of university de degree. So when you intertwine neoliberalism with war and to kind of draw it back to Iraq, because today is the anniversary of the occupation of Iraq, the 2003 one. I know whenever I say the occupation, everyone's like, which one? Because they bombed Iraq so many times at this point. Um, I'm referring to the 2003 one. So yes, it's the anniversary. And it's no secret that during that war that many polit politicians had um, gained exuberant amounts of wealth because of the politicians ties to these companies. So Dick Cheney's shares in Halliburton went through the roof because of the blueprint of the war. And we're seeing the same results in Yemen now and globally, right? These arms trade dealers are able to make these billions and billions and billions of pounds in trade at the expense of people's lives. Yes. Fantastic.